Okay. Got it. That was the most important part of my briefing. <laughs> I don't, I, thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening, good evening everybody. Good evening. Evening. Okay, good evening. Welcome. Evening and welcome. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is David Lemus. I'm the Vice of Provost Health and Head of the School of Life and Medical Sciences. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 23rd UCL Clinical Prize Lecture. This is a celebration of outstanding science, the impact it makes on the world, and the people who work so hard to achieve success. I'd like to start off by thanking Sanjeev Kanoria, Chairman of Advinia Healthcare Limited, Austrian Anadi Bank, and the Kanoria Family Foundation for generously sponsoring this event. You'll know here at UCL we talk a lot about disruptive thinking, and indeed disruptive thinking is one of the pillars of our philanthropic campaign. We're convinced that the most groundbreaking, life-changing discoveries are made when people have the space and the courage to think differently where the and just follow the evidence and their curiosity. This year's Clinical Prize winner embodies that ethos. A brilliant scientist whose disruptive thinking resulted in one of the most significant discoveries in biology. Professor Jennifer Doudna is Professor of Chemistry and Molecular and Cell Biology at UC Berkeley. She is renowned as one of the leading figures in the CRISPR revolution, the discovery and development of a technology that allows DNA in cells to be precisely edited. Her career has been dedicated to understanding the structure and function of RNA enzymes and then to engineering them. She's been long admired in her field, but she leapt to wider public awareness in 2012 when with the microbiologist Emmeline Charpentier, she became the first to show that CRISPR-Cas9 technology could edit genomes by altering sections of the DNA sequence. This extraordinary work opens the opportunity that in the near future, we'll be able to make fundamental, evolution-changing alterations to the human genome. It gives us a process whereby in the future, we may be able to cure and eradicate diseases such as sickle cell disease, muscular dystrophy, and Huntington's. It's already been effectively demonstrated in crops such as wheat and rice. Jennifer has received many accolades and awards, including membership of the National Academy of Sciences, election as a foreign member of the Royal Society, the Kavli Prize, the Breakthrough Prize for Life Sciences, the Heineken Prize, and the Japan Prize. She's a very worthy winner of the Clinical Prize Lecture and we're really honoured to have you with us this evening. Following the lecture, there will be the opportunity for some questions. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Jennifer to give the Clinical Prize Lecture. Jennifer. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here. I have to start by thanking especially, uh, of course, the uh, folks that uh, invited me, but I also want to acknowledge the students and, and postdocs. We had a fantastic lunch today. I really enjoyed meeting with you and hearing about your, your science and your vision for the future. And frankly, you, you, you are the future of science. So it was a real pleasure to have that opportunity. And in general, I've had a fabulous time here. I'm, I only wish I could stay longer, and I'll definitely be back. Mm -hmm. So the uh, story I'd like to tell you tonight is, is really one of a couple of things. It illustrates the serendipity of science. Uh, I think it illustrates the importance of curiosity-driven research and the importance of thinking um, about the impact of work that all of us are doing on a, a broader community of, of scientists and looking for ways that we can work together. And I've certainly benefited from, from all of those things in my own career. 
And, uh, and I thought I would start off this, uh, this uh, lecture by pointing out something that I think we're all familiar with, but I think is really a, a feature of, of current research in biology, and that is that the opportunities right now to, um, to interrogate genomes at both ends of scale are really profound. So on the one hand, it's now possible to sequence entire genomes quite inexpensively. We have, as a result, very large databases of human genomes and, as you know, many genomes of many other organisms that's given us a very interesting insight into the genetics of life. And then at the other end of the scale, we increasingly have ways of manipulating that genetic information. And that's re really where where my uh, work comes in, and as you'll see, as I'll tell you briefly, I definitely didn't start there. I started as a biochemist and a structural biologist thinking about how RNA molecules have evolved over eons on Earth to control the way that genetic information is actually deployed in cells. And I was thinking about problems that had to do with that fundamental question when I got involved in something called CRISPR. Uh, which was namely, oops, that wasn't what I wanted to do, uh, but, which is a, a bacterial <coughs> adaptive immune system that until a few years ago was a very obscure area of research, just a handful of labs around the world that were studying this. And it, it started as, a, again, a curiosity-driven project to think about and understand how bacteria fight viral infection that morphed into a powerful tool, technology, for manipulating the genetic information in essentially any type of cell or organism. And, and so just to give you a high-level picture of what this bacterial immune system is, this is a cartoon of a bacterial cell that is uh, in the process of being infected by a virus. And during infection, the virus injects its genetic information into the cell and for microbes that have a CRISPR immune system encoded in the genome, they have the ability to detect that foreign DNA, integrate small bits of it into the CRISPR sequence array that's encoded in the genome, and store it for uh, future generations. And so this is, a, this is a little cartoon that shows the way the CRISPR array is arranged. It's a, precise set of repetitive elements, sequence elements, that flank each newly integrated bit of viral DNA. So it's a, you can think about it like a genetic vaccination card for the cell. And so the cell is then able to employ that information by making an RNA copy of the sequence and combining it with proteins that are CRISPR-associated, or Cas proteins, that together with these RNA molecules are able to detect foreign DNA that have matching sequences to the guiding RNAs and allow the Cas proteins to destroy those foreign DNA elements. It's a wonderful, you know, fascinating sort of biological phenomenon that these cells have evolved an adaptive immune system that relies on RNA and proteins to do this. But as you'll see, this also has uh, enabled ad adaptation for a very different purpose, namely for manipulating sequences in the genomes of essentially any organism. So I wanted to show you a, a cartoon, this is a kind of a cartoon video that illustrates how this adaptive immune system operates. So you can see uh, bacterial cells here that are, uh, I'll start this, uh, being infected by viruses. And when the viruses arrive in the, in the medium, they, um, of course, interact with the surface of these cells, start injecting their, uh, their genetic material. And for cells that have a CRISPR system, as I mentioned, they can capture small, short sequences from these foreign elements in the CRISPR array. And they, they're stored in this very distinctive uh, pattern of sequences, which is how they were originally identified. And then the cell makes an RNA copy of that array, and these RNA molecules are chopped into units, each including just a single virally derived sequence shown by the colored uh, lines. And then for the system I'll talk about tonight, these RNAs combine with a second type of RNA called tracer and a protein called Cas9 to form an RNA-guided protein complex. And this protein complex searches the cell looking for sequences of DNA that match 
the sequence in the guiding RNA. And this shows how when the match occurs, the protein, Cas9, is able to make a double-stranded break at a precise position dictated by the binding site of this RNA molecule. So in bacteria, those double-stranded DNA breaks lead to degradation of the targeted DNA. So if that target is a virally uh, derived DNA molecule, it's a great way for the cell to identify and destroy those sequences. But it turns out that that fundamental activity of RNA-guided DNA cutting can also be harnessed for a different purpose. Now, I wasn't thinking about that at all uh, in the beginning when we started to investigate CRISPR systems. And especially for the students here, I think this is you know, something that's been a, a guiding principle of my career so far is that I've always looked for, uh, to work with people that are smarter than me and you know, who are um, you know, interested in, in sort of interesting niches in biology where there maybe aren't a lot of people working. And that was absolutely the case for CRISPR. So this system came to my attention in around 2006 or so when Jill Banfield, a colleague at Berkeley, was uncovering a lot of examples of CRISPR sequences in her bacterial uh, metagenomic DNA sequencing data. And at that time, nobody knew about this adaptive immune pathway, but there was a sort of something, something mysterious, something interesting about the fact that bacteria were storing pieces of viral DNA in the genome. And this is what intrigued a few labs who were noticing this to start investigating them, including our own. So uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, we ended up uh, starting to study the proteins and RNAs that were involved in these pathways, and that eventually led me to a conference in 2011 where I met Emmanuel Charpentier, who is a medical microbiologist who was studying a CRISPR system that is part of a bacterial system that is infectious in <coughs> immune-compromised patients. And so Emmanuel and I decided to collaborate to understand the function of a particular CRISPR protein called Cas9 that at the time was uh, particularly attracted our attention because it was a single protein that seemed to have all the capabilities necessary for protecting cells in some RNA-guided fashion, but at the, we didn't know how it worked. And so working together, we figured out that Cas9 has this dual RNA-guided property of recognition of double-stranded DNA. And not only recognition, but also DNA cutting. So it could make double-stranded breaks at places in DNA that were defined by the binding site of this RNA element. And importantly, once we understood how this system worked, we could program it ourselves in the laboratory by changing this short uh, sequence element in the, in the guide RNA and um, in a collaboration with Emmanuel's lab, Martin Yinek, who was a postdoc in my group at the time doing these initial experiments, figured out that he could actually change the guide RNA. I keep doing that. This. Um, he could change this guide RNA from a dual RNA, two separate molecules, to a single guide format shown here that made it even easier to manipulate the system in the lab because here we had a single protein and now a single transcript that could be easily adjusted in sequence to direct the Cas9 protein to different uh, pieces and segments of DNA. And it was really, I think, once we did this experiment, and Martin, you know, was one of the sort of moments in my career that I'll not forget, you know, Martin showing me his data, showing that we could program Cas9 with these guide RNAs to find and cut desired DNA sequences, that we looked at each other and realized that this work that started as a curiosity-driven project to understand bacterial immunity was going in a very different direction. And, and the reason for that was based on a lot of work that had gone on in the field of DNA recombination and repair over the previous 10 or 20 years, showing that in, uh, unlike in bacteria, in eukaryotic cells, plants, animals, fungi, etc., when cells experience a double-stranded break to the genome, they are able to detect these broken ends of DNA and repair them. And the repair pathways involve making uh, small changes to the DNA sequence shown on the left, so that you could use uh, DNA repair to disrupt a gene, or you could use it to integrate a new section of DNA by providing a DNA template for homology-directed repair. 
And so scientists had been using this strategy of introducing double-stranded breaks to genomes to do what was at the time widely known as genome engineering, using engineered proteins. And it could work very well, but it was just difficult enough to engineer these uh, required proteins for making targeted cuts to DNA that the technology hadn't really been widely adopted by a lot of labs. And the wonderful thing about the CRISPR-Cas system is that bacteria had already figured out a way to program a single protein to make targeted cuts. And once we understood how it worked, we could harness that for this uh, purpose. So here's a video that just illustrates how we imagine the system working in a eukaryotic cell. So we're zooming into the nucleus where the DNA, of course, is compacted in the form of chromatin. And amazingly, this RNA-guided bacterial protein is able to surveil the entire genome and find sequences that match the sequence of the guide RNA. When that match occurs, the protein has a mechanism of melting apart the two strands of DNA, allowing a hybrid to form with the RNA guide, and then active sites in the enzyme cut the two strands of the DNA and release it to repair enzymes in the cell that take over and fix the break by introducing a targeted change to that particular position in the genome. So it was uh, quite exciting when we published this work in the middle of 2012 to see labs rapidly beginning to adapt and test this technology in cells including uh, plants, animals, uh, zebrafish was the first uh, whole organism that was edited using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And as you know, this technology took off very rapidly because it turned out to be remarkably easy for people to deploy it in their system of interest with very limited sort of in upfront uh, input, either financial or, or in terms of expertise. And even in my own lab, you know, it's sort of amazing to think about, but you know, in those days we were doing essentially all biochemistry and structural biology, but very quickly I was able to train a first year graduate student, she actually trained, trained all of us, how to culture mammalian cells in our lab and start using CRISPR-Cas9 to make targeted changes. And that work was done before the end of 2012 by a lab that had no expertise in that area at the time. So that just sort of you know, illustrates how readily deployable this, this system really, really is. And so what's happened over the last seven years has been really, truly remarkable. It's been really exciting to see the technology taking off in so many different directions. And what I thought I would do very briefly is illustrate some of the ways that the CRISPR-Cas9 technology started to change uh, bio biological research. And I'll focus on four, uh, four aspects of this. Of course, uh, fundamental research has really been changed because we can now use this type of technology to genetically manipulate essentially any type of cell or, or organism. We can uh, imagine really interesting impacts on public health going forward, impacts in agriculture I think are going to be really profound, and then of course uh, biomedicine will be uh, widely affected by this technology as well. And I thought I would just give you uh, some examples of these kinds of applications, just to give uh, folks here, especially those maybe less familiar with this technology, w uh, show you how this is being uh, widely uh, applied across the biological sciences in ways that are, are uh, really quite diverse. So first of all, in, in fundamental research, so um, you know, this is, a, this is just one of many, many examples that I could point to that show how questions that have been uh, under investigation for a long time in research laboratories were suddenly addressable using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. One of them is this question about handedness in biology. So this is a, an example with snails. So these snails are naturally have a right-handed curve to their shell. You can't quite, maybe you can see it there. And you almost never find uh, animals with a left-handed <coughs> twist to their shell in nature. But this group in the earlier part of this year used CRISPR-Cas9 to figure out which gene is actually responsible for this. And they made left-handed snails 
by CRISPRing out, and you know, CRISPR has now become a verb, I guess, you know, you can actually make uh, targeted knockouts that turn these snails into left-handed uh, animals. And, um, and sort of answering one of the really interesting fundamental questions about the genetics of that handedness uh, problem or question in biology. In public health, there's a, a lot of interest in using CRISPR-Cas9 for something called a gene drive. This was, again, an idea that had been discussed. I mean, I remember people talking about this back when I was a graduate student in the 1980s. And the idea was, if you had a way to quickly insert genetic information into genomes, you could imagine that you could spread a trait through a population, such as these mosquitoes, through non-Mendelian inheritance. And this is just a cartoon that shows on the left-hand side how Mendelian inheritance works from uh, an initial mating pair, and then how a gene drive works. So you can see that with a gene drive, you get horizontal transfer of a genetic trait that spreads that trait very quickly through a population. And this fundamentally requires having some way to introduce changes, targeted changes to genomes. And with Cas9, this suddenly became not just a theoretical idea, but it became a reality. And the reason this maybe will have an impact in the future on human health, public health, is because of the potential to use this to create mosquitoes that are either sterile or unable to, um, to spread uh, parasitic disease. And um, of course, if you think about it, that's also raising very, very important questions about the use of a technology like this in the environment that are triggering lots of, of ongoing discussions about the safety and, and uh, appropriate ways of controlling and testing uh, this kind of application. Briefly, I'll just mention that I think in the area of agriculture, CRISPR is likely to have the, the biggest global impact, at least in the near term. And this is in a, just one, again, of many examples. This is research from Zach Lippman's laboratory at Cold Spring Harbor uh, Lab in the US, where he's been able to use CRISPR to alter the yield of tomatoes by changing, using CRISPR to target a gene that impacts the number of flowers that these plants have and the resulting number of tomatoes. And by, uh, by dialing up or down the expression of this one gene, it's possible to manipulate plants to either reduce or increase uh, tomato yield without changing the other properties of the, of the, of the tomatoes. And what's really important to, to appreciate is that this, the genetics of this process are shared by many different types of plants. So you can start to imagine how this could be used to manipulate crop yields in a number of different types of, of sectors and settings. And then finally, I wanted to, to, to mention another application of CRISPR that might not have come to your attention, and that's in the area of diagnostics. So this was originally work done in, uh, in our research lab by two former graduate students, <coughs> Alexandra East Selesky and Janice Chen, who both figured out that some CRISPR-Cas proteins have the ability to cut single-stranded DNA after binding to a target sequence. And so that gives them the ability to recognize a target using the RNA guide and then cut a single-stranded fluorescently labeled reporter DNA molecule in a way that releases a signal that is a beacon for detection. And so this is a system that's now being used in a number of labs and in a, at least two companies that I'm aware of that are interested in applying this for diagnostic purposes in a point of care setting. So, um, so these are all exciting areas of, of development with CRISPR-Cas, but you know, I think one thing that's very compelling to all of us is the, the potential impact on, uh, on human disease and the opportunity to use a technology like this, not only to understand the genetics of disease, but also to be able to maybe correct disease-causing mutations, something that's really very exciting. We had a number of discussions today about that possibility in, in different types of, of diseases. And, and I wanted to point out that this uh, type of, of application of CRISPR can really be deployed, and this is really true for any uh, organism, in two different 
in very different ways. One is in what we call somatic cells, fully differentiated cells that where the genetic changes introduced are not inheritable and they only affect an individual versus changes that happen in the germline and become heritable changes that can be passed on to future generations. And I think that the vast majority of applications in biomedicine, at least in the foreseeable future, will happen in somatic cells. And I'll, I'll try to explain why, but I wanted to give you one example of this. And this is a disease that I think a lot of us, or maybe everyone here, is very familiar with from maybe a fundamental biochemistry class that you, that you took, which is sickle cell anemia. This is a disease that has been well understood for decades, and uh, the genetics have been well understood. It results from a single base pair change in the beta globin gene in, uh, in the human genome that gives rise to a mutant form of hemoglobin that is uh, defective in the sense that it causes aggregation of the protein, leading to a sickled morphology of red blood cells that leads to blockage of, of, uh, of, of blood vessels and, uh, of course, terrible consequences for patients. It's one thing to understand the genetics of a disease like this. It's very different to think about how you might actually have uh, the ability to, uh, to, to cure it, to cure the underlying cause of this disease. And I wanted to share with you a short video clip from a forthcoming documentary called Human Nature that starts off with the story of David, a, a young student in America who has sickle cell anemia, and, uh, and then shows him in this clip going to Stanford University and seeing CRISPR-Cas9 applied to edit his own cells. So let's take a look. I hope there's, is there audio here? Let's see, I guess I have to start this. So now we're mixing the cells with the CRISPR. Once it's into the cell, that starts the editing process. We can't see that. We just know it happens. I don't know how out of all the genes that you have that it targets the one that's doing sickle cell and not the thing that's making you grow hair. Oh. But it does, apparently. I think that's cool. And this is so, so awesome when you see this, especially in the context of the film, because this young boy who has been suffering from repetitive visits to the hospital with crises from his sickle cell disease is really seeing the possibility, the potential of this kind of a technology to have an impact on his health and on people that uh, are afflicted with this disease. And um, so this is the film of Human Nature. And, and I think that you know, for, for all of us working in this field, it, it's, it's incredibly motivating to think about the potential of this technology to really change the health outcomes for people like David and many others that, that suffer from genetic disease. And it's certainly what keeps uh, me working hard and thinking hard about how we can make sure that this technology becomes available and, and really importantly, affordable uh, to people in the future. Um, but I want to briefly mention the other type of genome editing that I discussed, uh, the germ cell editing, because this has really gotten a lot of attention in the media, and in fact, we discussed it a bit today, because of the, the really profound uh, potential of this application of genome editing to alter uh, uh, humans and, and maybe even human societies if it went far enough. And that's uh, heritable germline editing, so making changes to sperm or eggs or embryos that lead to uh, alterations to the genome that are passed on to future generations. This is showing an example for pigs just to remind me to, to, to point out that germline editing has been going on in, uh, in animals with, with CRISPR and even with earlier technologies for, you know, for a long time. And with CRISPR, this was one of the early applications of, of, the, of the technology was to start making animal models of human disease. This is actually uh, taken, this slide comes from a recent publication from the George Church Lab at Harvard where they're actually using this now to alter pig genomes in the germline to create animals that could be better uh, uh, animals for organ donation in the future. 
But uh, of course, you know, with the applications in, applications in the germline, one of the questions that arose very early in this field was what about uses in the human germline? Would it be possible to make uh, changes to human embryos in ways that uh, would lead to, to sort of permanent changes in, uh, in individuals that could be uh, passed on to their progeny? And I started thinking about this in, you know, sort of very early after our initial publication with Emmanuel, but it was in early 2014 that I was, it really sort of came home to me how fast the field might be moving in that direction. And that was because of a publication that appeared early that year on germline editing in monkeys and showing that it was possible to use CRISPR-Cas9 to make a single targeted change to the monkey genome in, in monkey embryos that led to healthy uh, individuals that were born that had this, this targeted change. And I started thinking, gosh, I wonder you know, if this is going on in monkey embryos. Is there, are, are there labs that are already starting to think about or maybe even to move forward with applying it in, in human embryos? Something that I thought was just sort of mind blowing at the time to think about. And so that uh, motivated me to, uh, you know, I have to, I have to tell you that I was definitely not eager to uh, sort of start going public with, with that idea, but I felt compelled. And the reason was that it seemed uh, almost inevitable that the field would move in that direction. And I felt it was essential that scientists sort of grapple very openly with that potential of the technology and start uh, having public discussions about it. And so that motivated me to, have a, hold a meeting in California in, uh, I think it was January of 2015, we got that group together. It was a small group that discussed human genome and especially human germline editing. And importantly, we included two scientists that had been involved in the original discussions back in the 1970s that happened around molecular cloning. This was back when you know the technology was first available to cut and paste sections of DNA, and people started to imagine that this could cause problems if it were being conducted in the bacteria that populate the human, uh, the human gut. And, um, and so Paul Berg and David Baltimore were both involved in those, uh, those initial discussions in the 1970s. We had them at this uh, meeting in 2015. And, um, and then through a lot of back and forth discussion and wrangling, we were able to put together a paper that all of us eventually signed our names to that uh, was published that, that spring, notably just about a month ahead of a paper that appeared from a group that had actually conducted CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing in uh, human embryos in a research uh, setting at the time. If you look at this, this, this article just basically um, called for what was effectively a moratorium on using human germline editing until there was an opportunity for public discussion and discourse and, and maybe even uh, rethinking regulatory guidelines that might be implemented to control the use of this technology in that setting. Um, and then you may know that the Royal Society very importantly got involved with the National Academies after this and put out a report in, uh, in the spring of, of 2018 on human genome editing that really amplified that message and called for restraint, uh, global uh, restrictions on using CRISPR-Cas9 in human embryos. But that did not stop uh, this individual, the <coughs> Zheng Kui, from uh, doing exactly that. And so you can, you can imagine my uh, consternation receiving an email from him last November, just over a year ago, in which he informed me that he had actually used CRISPR-Cas9 to make germline changes to two uh, to twin girls that were born who had changes to the gene responsible for, uh, that encodes a co-receptor for, for the HIV virus. So the stated purpose of this was to protect these girls from HIV infection. But when we all arrived at a conference in Hong Kong where this work was announced, and this is a picture of him uh, presenting the work, it was, a, it was clear right away that this work was, was really inappropriate on multiple levels, both scientific, technical, and, and ethical. And I just thought I would show you one slide that illustrates the, 
really important sort of technical limitations of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology right now that make it absolutely inappropriate to apply in embryos. And that's due to the inability right now to control the way that DNA repair happens after CRISPR-Cas9 cutting. So this is something that in the research lab, if you're using this technology to, to knock out or disrupt a gene or even to insert new genetic information, you might not care if the knockout, you know, exactly what changes occur to lead to a genetic knockout, but you absolutely care if you're doing it in a clinical setting and especially in a way that makes a permanent change in the germline. So here's a, a slide that is, was created by, uh, by a, a scientist at uh, University of Massachusetts who just looked at the data that Hu Jiankui presented publicly and, um, and put this together. And you, all you have to notice, the details are, are not essential, but I just want you to notice that the top two bars don't look like the bottom three bars because the very top one illustrates a segment of the gene called CCR5 that encodes this HIV co-receptor. And the second one shows a illustration of the natural 32 base pair deletion that happens in uh, rarely in the human population, but when it does, it creates individuals that have a disruption to this gene that makes them uh, HIV resistant. And, and so Ho Jung Kui was intending to make the same 32 base pair deletion in these embryos, but when they were sequenced, and this is the data that he actually showed at the conference on the bottom three bars, they found that the changes made uh, were not this 32 base pair deletion, they were disruptions to the gene, but they all are dis distinct from this natural uh, deletion. And so they're, they are changes that have never been seen in the human population, to our knowledge, and have never even been tested in animals. So if you think about that, it's, it's really a, a profound thing to think that this was actually done on, on people. And, uh, I think if there's a silver lining to, to any of this, it's really that I think it was an important wake-up call that we needed to accelerate this uh, public discussion of germline editing. As you may know, there are now uh, international commissions that are looking into this. The UN has gotten involved in this, the World Health Organization. So I think there's been a, a, a lot of interest in it. It's also, of course, sparked a lot of uh, speculation and um, Hollywood movies. <laughs> Uh, journal covers, <laughs> you know, that, that uh, talk about CRISPR babies. And I get, this is probably the question I get asked the most often by lay audiences is, you know, is it going to be possible to uh, change, uh, you know, uh, height, um, uh, baldness, <laughs> IQ using CRISPR? And the answer, as I think many of the folks here will know, is that the genetics of these traits are complex, and for the most part, we don't know the interplay of genes that contribute to these traits. So certainly in the near term, this type of manipulation won't be possible. But I think that the, you know, the, uh, the um, interest in, in human embryo editing is not going away. And so I think it's incredibly important that, that we uh, be thinking now about how to appropriately regulate the technology to the extent possible. This is just a, pointing out that the World Health Organization, as well as other groups that I mentioned, are in the process of reviewing the science and putting out what I hope will be um, very detailed, uh, not only guidelines, but maybe the basis for future uh, regulation around this type of use of, of genome editing. So in the last few minutes, I just want to turn to the topic of, of you know, where, where's this field headed? Where are we going? with all of this. I think any of us working uh, right now, and you can see the pace at which uh, CRISPR-based applications are moving forward, it's, it's just kind of mind-blowing. It's hard to keep up with it all. And so I really see three important aspects to the use of the technology, especially for biomedical applications. One of them is continuing to advance the tools, making the tools more and more precise and the second is delivery, how we actually get these molecules into the cells and tissues where they will have clinical benefit. And thirdly, thinking about both efficacy, so effectiveness of the technology, as well as uh, ethical 
uh, implementation of the technology. And these are all really important to the future uh, uses in biomedicine. So with regard to the precision uh, editing of genomes, I, you know, was at a, I was at a, a Cold Spring Harbor laboratory uh, conference in October that I really, I have to tell you that at, when I was at that meeting and, and sitting in the audience listening to all of the talks, I really felt that we we're probably within about five years of being able to make targeted, precise changes to any genome. And to do that with, with, with you know, precision, allowing you to really control the way that those changes are made based on the very rapid advances being made in the field. And that's both exciting and, and a little bit, you know, uh, sort of uh, scary in a way because I think it really does underscore the importance of ensuring responsible uh, use of the technology. It'll be possible to make insertions, deletions, control transcription, even control epigenetic changes to genomes in ways that will uh, be very, uh, I think, important for understanding the genetics of disease, but also for altering the genetics of disease. Um, base editing, we discussed a bit today. These are all uh, technologies really on the forefront, targeted genomic mutagenesis, prime editing, being able to make uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in a targeted fashion, and all of these are really built around this fundamental RNA-guided Cas9 and related proteins that target them to particular positions in the genome. And this is a slide that just has some little cartoons that illustrate these technologies and show you that really over the last seven years, there's been a very steady pace of development of these kinds of tools. And for anyone that, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in this and you want to use any of these cartoons in your, in your slides, I invite you to visit the Innovative Genomics Institute website that has all of these uh, available for, for download. Delivery is clearly the gateway to applications of all kinds. And, um, and I think, again, that we're, you know, we're, we're seeing very rapid developments on cell type specific editing. Uh, targeted genome edits in cell populations and tissues, but we need innovation here. I think there's a really interesting opportunity right now for people that are either working on delivery or maybe don't work on delivery but think about other kinds of science that might be impactful here to get involved in the field. And that's one thing we're doing at the Innovative Genomics Institute is giving out grants that help uh, invite more people to get involved in this field and, and really innovate in an area that I think will be a, uh, a real bottleneck going forward. I thought I would show you uh, just two things going on in our own lab. These are just uh, some unpublished data that illustrate how we're thinking about this in a couple of ways. So one is a strategy that takes advantage of direct delivery of the CRISPR-Cas9 protein with its guide RNA. And if you want to use that in, in the clinic, whether you're doing uh, editing of cells in the laboratory that are going to be put into a patient or whether you're actually trying to do the editing in situ in a patient or a tissue, uh, this requires the ability of Cas9 to penetrate into cells and tissues. How do you do that? And we've been thinking about this and working on this for a few years, but recently we started working with a colleague in the chemistry department at Berkeley, Matt Francis, who has a technology for uh, using an enzyme called tyrosinase to link together two different proteins using natural amino acids that are on the surface of these proteins. By doing that kind of chemistry, we took Cas9 and we were able to couple onto it a cell penetrating peptide that gave Cas9 the ability to get into cells without electroporation, without nucleofection, but just intrinsically based on its properties and uh, create genome edits. And that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side. And we're excited about the potential of this to allow uh, targeted editing in, uh, in cells, at least initially in the laboratory, but maybe eventually in vitro, in, uh, in vivo as well. The other uh, strategy that we're taking right now is using virus-like particles. So the, the idea here is to take uh, a virus, and this is actually doing this with HIV virus, which is naturally evolved to get into T cells of the immune system, and to gut it of all of the genes necessary to, for infection, but retain the genes that make the, the encapsulation uh, structure of the virus. 
And these viruses can then be, these virus-like particles can be used to encapsulate molecules such as Cas9 with its guide RNA. And then when applied to a mixed population of cells, and this is some data that I'm showing you on the right-hand side, we just took mixed population of T cells taken from a donor and, um, and applied these virus-like particles with Cas9, and we're able to get a targeted editing of just the CD4 positive cells in this mixed population. Very recently, we've now been able to switch the tropism of these virus-like particles so we can get editing of just the CD8 positive cells in the mixture. And we're excited about the potential of this to allow targeted editing, ultimately, of, of cells and tissues in a way that you can start imagining would be uh, really valuable to apply in the clinic. As you may know, very recently, uh, the announcements from a uh, company, CRISPR Therapeutics, as well as from a group at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, announcing very early results of uh, very you know, limited, initially, clinical trials using CRISPR-Cas9 in cancer patients and in uh, blood diseases, including thalassemia and sickle cell anemia, have been quite encouraging. They look, looks like the strategy so far appears safe and, importantly, uh, effective, at least in, the, uh, in these blood disorders. And so there's been a lot of excitement, I think, in the field, just you know, starting to contemplate the potential impact of these technologies as they continue to advance. So I think you know, in the big picture here is really that the, you know, the power of RNA-guided gene manipulation, gene regulation is, is really profound and I think has given rise to this whole growing toolbox of, of a technology that will enable targeted uh, genome editing. We know that delivery and control of editing is, is really key and, uh, and that fundamental research will continue to drive the field forward, including discovering whatever comes next after, after CRISPR. And I want to just close by acknowledging many of our uh, collaborators, our uh, funding agencies, and really importantly, a fantastic group of scientists that I have the, the real privilege of working with in my lab at Berkeley and at the Gladstone Institute at UCSF who have been um, really, really uh, dedicated to driving forward uh, their research, and some of which I presented today. And with that, I'll just uh, end. I want to point you to our website with the Innovative Genomics Institute. Please check us out. And uh, thank you again for inviting me to UCL. Truly, truly fabulous lecture. Thank you very much. And to think that 2012, it was first hit the press, and now, six, seven years later, the impact has been quite, quite extraordinary. So we have some time for questions. There is a roving microphone somewhere. Yep. Uh, two roving microphones. So any questions? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> hi. Thank hi. you very much for a super interesting lecture. I really, really enjoyed it, even though I'm not from a microbiological discipline myself. Uh, I'm just wondering, with the relative ease of the technology being applied here, what do you think the risk for black market underground laboratories releasing this technology into the wild? And uh, is there any way of discovering such releases um, into the wild? Well, I think, I think CRISPR is like, like any uh, technology that has this kind of democratizing property where it's you know, widely available, it's inexpensive, it's relatively low uh, uh, barrier to entry, if you will. That means that it's, you know, on the one hand, really rapidly advancing uh, science, but on the other hand, has the potential to be uh, used as you as you described, and I think that um, uh, this is you know this is just something that I think we have to keep on top of. One of the one of my motivations in 
working with groups that are uh, you know, giving public lectures and all sorts of things to try to have transparent conversations about this. Is I, I firmly think that it's better to have this out in the open and discussed rather than hidden away. And you may know that, for example, the World Health Organization, one of the early calls that that international commission has made is to have a registry for people that are especially for uh, human embryo work that's going on with genome editing. Um, and there's no, you know, there's no perfect answer to this, but I think we have to be just actively engaging and, and uh, encouraging transparency going forward. Yeah, the front. <clears throat> Thank you very much for next lecture, Nadia Hakim from Imperial College. Uh, there was a headline three days ago in the Telegraph where you said that, that we are having nightmares about Hitler. <laughs> now, is this related to a very similar thing you had in Hong Kong last year when you visited the gentleman and you were obviously shocked by his uh, uh, techniques? Did you stay for the whole meeting or withdraw or did you tell him off of, uh, about what he was doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, no, I, I stayed and in fact we had several, we had several, he asked me if we could meet one-on-one, -on -one, which we did right before the start of that conference in Hong Kong. So I, I uh, changed my flight, I flew early there, we met, um, and you know, it became increasingly clear that the work that he had done was, in my opinion, really inappropriate. But like I said, I think you can't, you know, it had been done already, so it was sort of too late to run away from it. I encouraged him to proceed with his his, uh, his presentation at the conference. He had been previously invited, so he was already on, on the schedule. And I think all of us that were on that organizing committee felt it was critical that he actually present uh, his work in, in that public forum, which he did. And that allowed everyone to see what was done and draw their conclusions from it. So again, I, I'm a big believer in you know, transparency, and I, I hope that that will help with the, the, the sort of the, the creating a, a regulatory climate that will help control the use of the technology in the future. Thank you. Just one addition about sickle cell. Do you yeah. see a day when we might have eradication of sickle cell? Obviously, a lot of African countries are quite keen on this to happen. Is this likely to happen? I know. Yeah, I think eradication is, is a, that's a difficult thing to, to um, you know, it's difficult, right? Because it, it, there are many people worldwide that are affected. And of course, one of the things that will impact the deployment of the technology will be the cost. So one of the, thing, one of the things that really motivates me right now, and especially with the work we're doing on targeted T-cell editing, for example, that I showed you the one slide for, is that if one could actually do that efficiently in patients, you could imagine getting around the need to do a bone marrow transplant on each of those individuals, which would obviously save cost, it would be much better for patients. So I think, I think there are innovations like that that need to, to still be developed before we could Im imagine eradication. However, do I think in the next five years we'll see more and more people uh, treated with this technology? I do, and I think we're already seeing the, p the potential of that to be profound. Yeah, question here. Uh, yeah. Lady here. Yep. No, just, just one second. Microphone's on its way. Just one second. There you go. Great. Thank you. Is the CRISPR-Cas9 system only used by bacteria, or is it also used by archaea as well? It's also used by archaea, yeah. So it's not... So it's evolved much earlier. Yeah. I mean... It's, the evolution is an interesting question, actually, because there's a lot of evidence that these CRISPR-Cas systems are being transferred horizontally in organisms, making it very difficult to actually trace uh, lineage. But it looks like it doesn't occur naturally in eukaryotic cells, at least now. Whether it means it was lost or, uh, or never, never existed there isn't clear. Thank you. Yep, over there. Just over there. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks for the great lecture. Um, Given that the initial clinical applications here have all been things like uh, bloodborne um, targets or uh, I think Edisas going into the eye compartmentalized, uh, what do you think the potential for you know, in vivo, true in vivo application of these um,
techniques are and what do we know what to look for in terms of off-target effects given you know the controversies that have sort of popped up over the years of you know cuts elsewhere in the genome right so um, I, I think the main point of your question is about off-target effects and how will that impact clinical applications so I think that um, from what I've seen in our own lab as well as in data from many others off-target editing and just to define that for folks here that basically refers to changes to genomes that might happen at a site where you don't want to change and that could be due to you know for multiple reasons um, that's certainly something where uh, you'd like to avoid that for, for clinical use and I think that as the technology has advanced it's become possible with careful guide RNA design controlling the expression levels of Cas9 in, in cells um, and, and also very carefully monitoring editing that occurs in cells to, to really avoid uh, the majority of off-targets. Now, that being said, I think the bar needs to be obviously very high for clinical uses, and I think there's still ongoing work to figure out the best ways to really monitor off-target events and, and, importantly, to be able to compare off-targeting that might happen with different uses of, of the CRISPR system. So that's still ongoing. But personally, I don't see that right now as a bottleneck going forward. I, I really don't. I think that it's uh, already possible to control uh, the targeting accuracy pretty well. And, and as the technology advances, it'll be in the future possible to both avoid off targets and uh, detect them when they happen. So quick questions, if I may, because um, yeah. lots of people are interested. So one, two, and three. OK. So one. Really yeah. distributive, thank you. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you show, you know, gen drive technology, but can, can you stop that when it starts? Because you can modify an entire species, right? So can you stop gen drive or can you reverse the gen drive process? Well, uh, there, are, there are a number of groups, including uh, here in the UK, working on gene drives. And um, the work that I've seen is really interesting because I think that, uh, like Andrea Crisanti, for example, here in the, in the UK is, 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 I think, one of the really very good researchers doing this work. And he's been able to show that he can get a gene drive to work very efficiently in the lab, but they also have ways they're working on to control those drives, turn them off, for example. And I think that's a key for that kind of technology. You want to be able to uh, turn it on, but importantly, uh, be able to turn it off. And I think that that's, that's really right where the, the field is at the moment, is figuring out how to do that. Yeah, question at the back. Hello. Uh, going back to the portion of your lecture where you talked about uh, the questionable use on the twins, and you showed data about how the DNA had been changed. Uh, why, why is, does that not happen in your other examples with mosquitoes and tomatoes? Or if it does, why is it okay? Yeah, so it does, it, the, the answer is it does happen. And the reason is that, to, at least right now, with the use of the kind of the original technology of CRISPR-Cas9, which generates a double-stranded DNA break, when cells repair the break, there are different ways the repair can happen. So that can lead to different detailed genetic changes. And today, that's not easy to control in cells. Why do, why do we not care as much if that's happening in a gene drive or in a tomato? Well, the reason is that in a tomato, if you're trying to knock out a gene, you maybe don't care the detail of how that knockout works. Maybe you do, but, but, but maybe, maybe you don't, right? And it's not something that's going to be inherited by future humans where there could be a very profound healthcare outcome that, you know, would obviously be, be really, really bad if it were a negative outcome. So I think that's really the reason that I didn't uh, highlight that for these other applications. But I wanted to point out that, that slide to you because I think it helps illustrate one of the current limitations of the field that many researchers are working to overcome, which is to be able to really have precision in these edits meaning not just being able to target a change to a particular place, but to actually control the change that's made to the genome. And I, that's, that's coming, but it's still really mu very much an active area of development in the field. There's loads of questions, but I'm going to have to limit to two more, if that's OK. So one here and then Marco at the back. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. I wonder if you could comment on 
the discussion that's happening particularly in California around patentability of business models in this area. And I don't know if looking at the ethical debate, <clears throat> you've had much exposure to the decade-long discussion we'd had in the UK around mitochondrial transfer and three-parent babies, which I think has some similarities to how you uh, think about this. Yeah. Well, to answer the second question first, maybe, I think the mitochondrial transfer, that, um, that whole situation here in the UK really uh, had an important impact on thinking, I think, globally and certainly in the US with my colleagues about how to think about you know, the applications of, of genome editing in embryos and how IVF clinics might or might not you know, employ the technology in the future. So, um, and those discussions are, are, are very much ongoing. But I sense, and I see this in myself, frankly, but I also see it in my colleagues, that there's change occurring in people's thinking. I think, you know, for folks that initially thought that'll never happen or we would never want to see that happening in IVF clinics, today I hear more, I, I tend to hear more uh, people saying, well, it clearly will happen in the future, so we should figure out how to make sure it happens in a responsible fashion. Right. And again, I think the mitochondrial transfer is a, is a really interesting example of how that issue was grappled with here. Um, and then to your first question about patentability and you know, how do we deal with intellectual property around technology, you know, I, as I told the students at lunch, you know, th this has been a wild ride for me over the last seven years, not, not, not least of which has been the whole patenting situation, because I really knew nothing about patents before this came along. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, I've learned, I've learned a lot about it, uh, some of it not, not so pleasant. But, um, but I think the bottom line, and you know, I think, well, two things. One is I think the patent dispute will be ongoing for the foreseeable future. Why? Partly because lawyers stand to make a lot of money from it, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of, a lot of that. But the, good news, the other point is, the good news, I think, scientifically that I see is that the patent dispute notwithstanding, there's, you know, there's been no uh, slowdown in the pace of development of the technologies and applications of the technologies. We're seeing billions of dollars, as you know, invested in companies that are uh, using the platform to do all sorts of things that I think will have positive benefits in the future. So scientifically, I feel like you know, we're, we're just forging ahead. We're not letting lawyers uh, slow us down. And last question. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. My question was actually about the, uh, about the patents, but specifically, was there a significant delay in getting your initial data published uh, because of a, of a patent application? No. So, no, there wasn't, actually. So, you know, when Emmanuel and I were writing up that work, you know, we had, we, we, you know, we were able to submit our work for publication as one does. And, um, and uh, you know, we consulted with our universities and they said, oh yes, probably a good idea to file a patent application on that, um, which they did. So that wasn't the issue. I think the problems came later and had more to do, frankly, with legal wrangling than anything else. Jennifer, that's truly fabulous. Thanks very much. I'm gonna hand over now to our president and provost, Michael Arthur, to award the, uh, the prize. Uh, Jennifer, shortly I'm going to uh, present you uh, with uh, our medal, but um, before doing that, I wanted to say a few uh, very important thank yous. So first of all, um, you met with our students at lunchtime, um, and I've had reports back that that was an absolutely phenomenal experience for each of them. They really valued the opportunity to interact with such a world-class scientist. So a huge thank you on behalf of UCLM from the students for for doing future. that. It was great. Uh, the Dean of Medicine uh, of Medical Sciences, Mark Emberton, who sat there in the audience, came away ecstatic. Uh, so thank you for making our... Uh, <laughs> thank you for making our Dean of uh, Medical Sciences very happy, in fact, ecstatic. Uh, he's usually a happy guy, but you made him really, really uh, happy today. Um, and that's uh, absolutely wonderful. Early in your lecture... You mentioned the importance of curiosity-driven uh, science. Um, and I think that's very obvious to everybody uh, in this room. It gets less obvious when you get to the public. And it gets, uh, that gets translated, of course, through into 
um, our governments being less than certain about the importance of curiosity science. So to hear you mention it and to emphasize it uh, is an important reminder to all of us that we're in a bit of a battle about this in both of our countries at the moment and we must um, uh, renew our efforts in that regard. Uh, you then took us on what I can only uh, describe as a tour de force, your lecture. Um, when I met you this afternoon, I didn't really expect to be discussing left-handed and right-handed <laughs> snails, <laughs> uh, but it was a wonderful uh, example of the power of the technology, and you took us from there to uh, gene drives and mosquitoes, uh, to enhancing crop yields, to point-of-care diagnostics, and then, of course, through to somatic cell uh, genome editing for the treatment of sickle cell uh, anemia, and then more controversially into uh, heritable uh, genome editing. And I think the way that you handled the ethical and moral dilemmas in your lecture was truly exemplary. So thank you very much for uh, taking us through that. Now, of course, your work has been uh, recognized appropriately uh, by many different agencies. You are a previous winner of the Kavli Prize, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, uh, the Heineken Prize, the BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award, and the Japan Prize. But I'm going to submit to you that you've got one crucial prize missing from that list. <laughs> I, of course, refer to the UCL uh, Clinical Lecture Prize Medal. And it's my great pleasure to hand you this medal, and thank you very much for everything you've done. Thank you very much. I think the volume and the length of the applause says it all. It uh, is wonderful. And uh, now, uh, just an announcement. There is, of course, a reception. I think it's in the Jeremy Bentham room. Everybody is welcome. Uh, and, of course, we'll be wandering over after a few photographs to keep the discussion going. Thank you again. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Tell me about this uh, medal. So it's designed, I believe, I think it's designed by...